discussing string engaged tricks. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's my first time at Natal. It's very nice. Uh, so I'll be talking about resurgence and trend series in string and gauge theories. This is work that's been going on for quite a while, 10 years now, with a lot of people. And I'm just going to take a, a tour over the bolded uh, references, and well, actually, just here and there, and then up to upcoming work. All right, so what's the idea? So when we're trying to compute something, it uh, doesn't really matter at this stage, quantum mechanics, field theory, string theory, whatever you like, uh, we use perturbation theory, and perturbation theory is great, but not that great, because it's asymptotic. So let's imagine I want to compute some quantity F, which is up there, which could be, you know, if you like quantum mechanics, could be the ground state energy of whatever, anharmonic oscillator. If you like field theory, it could be a beta function. If you like string theory, it could be free energy in some coupling Z, H bar, G string, whatever you want. And I'll take Z to be large, so, you know, if you want, you can have the large N expansion in mind. And if you do that, then you compute those coefficients fg up there. That's the g loop order coefficient, and they grow as g factorial, which means that that series itself, it's asymptotic. It's got zero radius of convergence. It doesn't converge anywhere. So you cannot really get the number out of it. So this is well known for a long time. And one way around it is also known for a long time, which is to use this object, which is the Borel transform, which is basically a machine that cuts the factorial growth. And what's left, it's the subleading growth of those coefficients, which is exponential. And because it's exponential, it has a positive radius of convergence. So I can define my Borel transform on a disk on the complex plane. And then I can do analytic continuation throughout C. And I have the Borel transform well defined. If I want to go back to the question I had, you know, what's the energy of my ground state in quantum mechanics, a beta function in gauge theory, free energy in string theory, or whatever, I have to invert. So I have to come back. And the way I have the inversion goes is basically you plug back in the factorial and you use this, uh, this kernel which represents the, the gamma function, which is essentially a Laplace transform. So this would be the Borel resumed object you started off with back in your coupling Z plane. And you should be able to do this along any direction on the complex plane because you want to go non-perturbative. So I don't care about a specific theta. I care about all theta so I can define the object I started off with anywhere on the complex plane. So that's great. And you know, the problem would end here unless when I'm doing the Laplace integral, I hit a, so this is going to be a problem without the iPad. Uh, I hit the um, a singularity of the Borel transform. So what means is that there will be direction theta on the complex plane along which this guy is going to have singularities. And then I have to specify what's going to happen with the integration contour. It's going to go either above or below uh, that singularity. So those lines where I have singularities are known as Stokes lines. And we know that they are always present no matter what the problem is, as long as it was asymptotic to start off with. So if there was no... Uh, singularities, that would just mean that that series was well defined and I didn't have to do that. So, no, not really. Uh, the charger, maybe then it, it will not uh, shut off. The pointer, it's fine. But perhaps the charger will solve the problem that the iPad wouldn't have. All right, so if I, I have to worry about this issue facing singularities, the first thing you can have is what kind of singularities can I have? And Singularities have been classified, and this is where resurgence comes in. So generically, a resurgence function is some formal asymptotic series whose Borel transform has endless analytic continuation. So basically, anything you can think of goes, except if there are natural boundaries on the complex plane. Otherwise, it works. So that's way too broad and generic. So we're going to use a simpler definition, which, you know, as the name says, is the simple resurgence function. And those are resurgence functions whose Borel singularities restrict to simple pools. And this is the only time I'm going to talk about them. I'm going to forget them straight off because they're always trivial to include. And logarithmic branch points. So that's what I'm sort of showing here. So I'm looking at the Borel transform of whatever I'm computing next to omega. Omega is a simple singularity. And that's just looking what happens close to omega. So I'm going to have a logarithmic branch cut. Here's the log. I'm going to have some stuff which is regular. I don't care. I'm just looking at what the singularities are. And I'm going to have some coefficient in front of the log. 
And the art of this business is to write this coefficient as the Borel of something else. And that's what's going to make everything clear. And we write it here as the Borel of something else up to a constant. These constants are going to appear later on, and I'm going to tell you what they are for the moment. Just so now I can be specific about what happens when I cross the Stokes line. Because here's the Stokes line. I have singularities at the black dots along theta. And I'm trying to decide, am I going to do the integration on the left? Am I going to do on the right? Well, they're related. If I go from the left to the right, I basically the, 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 the dark blue becomes the light blue up to the Hankel contours in red. So I just have to sum them. So that's this difference. And now if I just introduce the logs, because of the, the Laplace guy just grabs the, the jump of the log up to the exponential term, and this is what I get. So we call this the discontinuity of the asymptotic approximation as I cross the Stokes line, which looks like this. Remember that Z by coupling is large, so these guys are exponentially suppressed. The art of writing stuff as the Borel of something else makes the something else appear. <laughs> and then this is all true up to some constants. And I'll come to these constants later on. So the punchline is that all these sectors must be included. Perturbative series is not enough, and this is what's going to lead to trans series which is basically put everybody together, and resurgence, which says, well, yeah, there's a lot of people, but they actually are all related to each other, not that kind of thing. All right, so I'm going to be interested in doing this in the large and expansion and in the string theory coupling expansion. So just, uh, just the, the setup, of course, is we're going to be looking at topological strings on Calabi-Yaus, and we're either going to look at some simple, like say, called enumerative-like geometries, or later on, we're going to be looking at Dachraff Waffe geometries, where basically the Calabi Yaws are constructed a vibration over a curve. That curve is great because it already relates to the matrix model. So the, the, the curve over which I build this vibration is exactly the spectral curve of the matrix model. And it's for a long time that the special geometry of the Calabi Yaws solves for you the three level string, or if you want the planar matrix model. And this can be extended to all genera. So there's a, a recursion, topological recursion that tells you how to do all these. In the matrix model, the holomorphic anomaly tells you how to do all this. In the string theory, and what we'd like to answer is if we can go beyond this asymptotic large and expansion. All right, so uh, here's the plan, and I, I'm probably not going to have time to cover all this, so I mean, we'll see how far we get. So uh, basically, I want to get up to 0.4, and then we'll see if there's one other topic that might be of bigger interest if there's time. So I'm just going to go a bit over some generics, extremely vague generics on transition resurgence, and then I'll focus on uh, solving this uh, on string theory using the holomorphic anomaly. And then if there's time, we'll look at uh, the duals using metric models. All right, so a few words on trans series resurgence and all that. So I, we all know that analytic functions are you know, well described by power series. Basically, it's power series in it's a bunch of monomials to some power. We'd like to know how to describe non-analytic functions, which is where this business comes in. And so we use trans series. That basically just says that instead of just looking at monomials of my coupling, I'm also going to look at trans monomials. Trans monomials are these objects, which basically there's just two classes of them that I'm writing here. So now for, for the sake of uh, you know, making something a bit more familiar, I'm doing the expansion around x equals 0. And then the, the, the element, elementary trans monomials would be this exponential that you know, it's the instant unlike thing we've seen many, many times, and the log. But that's not the whole story, because I can and I should iterate all these things. So I can just build arbitrarily complicated transmonomials by iterating exponentials or arbitrary complicated transmonomials by iterating logs. So this is called like exponential height and logarithmic depth. And the statement in this story is that if you do all that and you use this as a basis for your trans series, so you consider all powers of all these transmonomials either in X or logs, you should be able to solve any problem you want. Uh, so far, <laughs> we've only needed those two guys. Uh, but we've been solving topological strings and minimal strings, so I'm not, I cannot guarantee that this is not going to be required at, uh, um, let's say, later stage. And definitely, this has already been seen in, in, in the literature, say, the SYK matrix models and stuff like that. All right, so I consider from now on just this basic uh, trans monomials, and what's a trans series? A trans series is that, let's just put all these guys together in a sort of double series expansion. That's what I'm writing up there. So you see that this is a double expansion in the following sense. L let's look at the FNs to start off with. The FNs, basically, well, F0 is just a perturbative series. That's just a power series in a monomial. 
And with n bigger than zero, I basically have instanton-like guys. So now I'm back to, I'm sorry, I'm jumping between this z and x. So z is large. So that guy is non-analytic. A would be the instanton action, so that's something familiar, and those are just the different n instanton sectors, which basically you can think as the nth transmonomial power of that thing. And next to the n instanton sector, I can still do a loop expansion. Those are the n's, and those will give me back powers of the monomial in 1 over z. That beta is just some characteristic exponent, which uh, might be important later on if we get to the matrix model side. So you see that this is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of describing all non-perturbative information using this sort of double perturbative expansion, because I'm doing a perturbative expansion in the monomial and in the transmonomial, putting everybody together. And then there's the sigma. There's a sigma which appears there. This is usually known as a trans series parameter, which at, at the formal level, when I put all these guys together, is sort of an instanton counting parameter. But you can think of this as a choice of boundary conditions. So you can think of this trans series as a solution to a differential equation. And of course, solutions to differential equations are families of solutions. And I need to specify boundary conditions to, to, you know, to pick a specific solution. And that's what the sigma would be. It would parameterize the family of solutions. And if I pick a sigma, I'm picking a particular one. So trans series, they yield most general solutions to nonlinear systems because I can just plug this sort of assets, put it in my problem, and crank the wheel. And generically, I get uh, recursive equations for all these guys. And they're recursive in the sense that I, you know, if the problem is nonlinear, I cannot solve them exactly, but at least I can generate a lot of data on the compute. And so that's the statement of trans series. The statement of resurgence is, yeah, you have a lot of guys, but they're actually not all independent of each other. They're actually very much related to each other. There's a very tight web of relations between all these coefficients. And so the slogan that people say sometimes that this means that you can obtain non-perturbative data out of perturbative data alone. So if you, if you have enough information about your perturbative series, you should be able to find all those gaps in the trans series. All right, so let's consider that we have instanton action A and our Stokes line. Uh, basically, the problem is nonlinear, so it's going to generate a, some direction on the complex plane that I have at your spaced values all my singularities. And the singularities look like that. So again, I'm forgetting the pole and the holomorphic part. I'm just focusing on the singularity uh, around Ka of the nth sector. So that was the n, the n instanton. So let me read the sentence. At the Ks singularity of the Borel n instanton sector, so that the Ks singularity, and I'm looking at the n instanton sector, what do I find? I find that the the, the singularity is logarithmic and has some guy in front. And the guy in front turns out to be exactly the Borel of plus k guy, again up to a constant. Uh, and so we say that's the, the, the origin of the name. We see the resurgence, it appears there in the singularity of the n plus k instanton sector. So if I look at my, if I have my whatever n series, and that n could be zero, and I start looking at what happens close to the singularities, I can pinpoint each of the other guys. That's the structure, and this is very much generic. And you can see there is the non-trivial information encoded, of course, in the n's and the n's plus k's themselves, but also in these Borel residues. These are numbers which are usually hard to compute, and in many cases we have to compute them numerically. We, we still don't know them, how they look like analytically. In string theory, I mean, this is sort of uh, straightforward to apply now. Uh, it, let's look at the free energy. It has, you know, well-known perturbative genus expansion in powers of gs squared. That just means that the large order behavior is now 2G factorial instead of G factorial. That's not a problem. Um, and the trans series completion, we just have to start building the n instanton sectors. This will come to, to it in, in 10 minutes. I'll tell you how exactly these are built. So let's just imagine for the moment that, yeah, okay, you built those guys. What can you do with them? Uh, well, I just do Borel resummations of all of these n sectors. In practice, this is not exactly a Borel resummation because I don't actually know all of these FNGs. We generate this, we've generated this up to you know, three, four instanton numbers, and the, um, let's say up to loop order 20 or so, something that depends a little bit on the instanton number. So you have a bunch of guys, so you have to approximate what the Borel is. So what, what we usually do is we do a Pade approximant to the Borel transform, and that just, um, th so it's a rational approximation to this function, and by looking at the poles, we can sort of guess where the, the log branch cuts are going to sit. Then we do a Borel resummation. Again, in practice, this is, um, this is numerical because you have usually a quite complicated rational function to do. And then you put all back into what we call this Borel Pade Ecal, the name of the resurgence, uh, Jean Ecal, into the trans series. And this is the object that should allow us to go anywhere 
on actually on the complex plane of G-string, if you want. So this has been done in a couple of examples. We've reached arbitrary coupling. This means arbitrarily strong coupling, for instance, in large and expansion uh, and complex numbers. But in order to do this, we have to be careful and incorporate Stokes phenomenon. So what does that mean? Is that when I cross the Stokes line, uh, I have to take into account all the Hankel contours in red. And this actually has a very simple translation from the point of view of the trans series. It just means that the trans series parameter jumps by a Stokes factor. That's all there is. So if originally sigma was zero and all I had was my perturbative series, when I cross a Stokes line, this, let's say, rule is telling me that whatever was zero has to jump by a specific factor, which just says when I cross a Stokes line, oh, look, there's an exponentially suppressed guy there. I have to take it along. I grab it, I take it along for the ride, okay? And then on the other side of the Stokes line, things are going to be corrected by um, instanton, instanton corrections. And, and in fact, I can even have dominance of instantons because, you know, it was exponentially suppressed. I grab it, it comes along, I'm going on the complex plane, and it becomes of the same order as the perturbative eventually takes over. So these things can also be very clearly seen. All right, so a word on asymptotics. So you can ask, well, how do you know that all these objects that you're trying to compute are actually resurgent? Why, why is this not all just formalism, which uh, has no uh, contact with reality? Because we can do a lot of tests. So we can prove theorems. In mathematics, people prove theorems whether a solution to a nonlinear differential equation is resurgent or not. So here, this is much harder. harder. And what we do is we do asy asymptotic tests. Let me just give you a, a glimpse of what this means. It means that let's look at the perturbative series, and we can exactly uh, specify what's its large order growth. This is done via resurgence because resurgence tells me exactly what kind of singularity, uh, I'm sorry, what kind of discontinuities I can find. And then by using see this person relation kind of argument, I can find the large order behavior of, of the perturbative. So this here is a generic thing. I have a generic uh, perturbative series. You can see that it grows at leading order factorially. And then at subleading order, it grows exponentially. It's the instant on action, up to, again, the Stokes factors. And if you look at what type of corrections I can have, now I could have, the, this is one loop around the one instant on, two loop around the one instant on comes with a one over G to the asymptotics, and so on. And then I can do the same at two loops, I'm sorry, at two instant on, so I have uh, exponential corrections, two to the minus G, then the one loop around the two instant on, one over G, two loop around the two instant on, and so on, and so on. So just to give you a picture of what's going on, if I know the non-perturbative guys which are sitting on, say, a Stokes line along, along theta equals zero, uh, I can use these sort of large order relations that are dictated by resurgence to predict the larger the growth of the perturbative. So I can see how, you know, if I'm given some perturbative series and I'm sort of saying this is resurgent and I can compute non-perturbative uh, quantities, I can say whether that matches or that doesn't match. And, and, and the punchline here is that the green lines should not just be thought of pointing to the left, they can also be pointing to the right, because I can at the same time, out of my perturbative series, decode um, its non-perturbative content by looking at exactly how it grows factorially, uh, uh, how it goes exponentially, how it goes polynomially, and so on, and decode all these things. So that's why we say that you know, if we have some perturbative series, we should be able to decode its full non-perturbative content. Of course, this is only true up to these Stokes constants, or only access most of them numerically, but this game can be played. And the point is that, of resurgence, is that this is not only true for the perturbative series, this is true for pretty much anyone. Here's the three instanton. So the three instanton is gonna have contributions coming from the guys, uh, let's say the higher instantons, and from the previous guys. So there's close for form formulae for all of this. Here I'm just giving you, so there's some dots here. I'm just giving the first few guys. So you have a forward guy with an S1, and then you have backward guy, here's minus a and plus a, that tells you one a to forward to the four a, and he, this guy tells you one way back to the two a, and so on. And more Stokes data is going to be needed. And it, typically what happens is that Stokes data of the forward guys is easy to find, Stokes data of the backwards guys is hard to find. This is sort of the main point, and you can do lots of these. String theory is slightly different because in string theory, there's always a plus a and a minus a. This, of course, has to do with the fact that I want to find, at the perturbative level, um, an expansion which is in powers of string coupling squared. And so this gives, basically, that's the structure. It's a two-parameter trans series. I'm going to have a and minus a. 
It's resonant, which is something I'm not going to talk about, but it leads to some new features on the Borel plane. And the asymptotics, again, you see that there's always a contribution of A and minus A, so that the, the even guys survive, the odd guys die out when you do this. And there's, of course, formulae for this that are arbitrary instant one All right, so this has been checked. This kind of asymptotics has been checked in many examples. So let me give you a couple of, um, of examples on how to do this. So let's look at uh, the holomorphic anomaly and how this machinery can be used within the holomorphic anomaly. So just a word first on the holomorphic anomaly. So we'll be looking at uh, the B model on some local Calabi L mirrored to some toric. So that's the setting we're going to be looking at. And the good thing is that on the mirror side, basically all the non-trivial information is encoded in the Riemann surface. That just makes things slightly easier. And if you want to compute the string-free energy, it's an object that it's going to look like that. Now Z here is not the Z, same Z as before. It's the complex structure moduli. I'm on the B model. And that's the string coupling. So can I do this, or how can I do this? Well, it's a well-known story that uh, the genus G free energies are not holomorphic. There's a holomorphic ambiguity or anomaly. Uh, so they depend on Z and Z bar. The idea is basically that if you compute the anti-holomorphic derivative of the genus G free energy, it's given as a, a total, total integrand over moduli space. So if moduli space has a boundary, this is non-vanishing. And you know, this is also, let me just give you a picture so we go on. It's well known that moduli space has a boundary where a genus G surface degenerates. So here's the genus 2, and it can generate, degenerate to genus 1, doing that pinching, it's connected, or to 2 genus 1 disconnected. And somehow this translates schematically to these equations. I, I don't need more than this form because I'm basically going to be presenting data and not actually solving them explicitly. It translates to the holomorphic anomaly equation. So basically there's a covariative uh, First, the generation, and there's a product, well, h goes from 1 to g minus 1, of these, uh, these guys here, the disconnected ones. And observe that all I have on the right-hand side is genus less than g, so this is recursive. So I can, if I compute one, I can compute the next, and the next, and the next, and the next. And in fact, this has been done already uh, by Clement collaborators already in 2008 at the perturbative level. They computed this to, uh, I don't know, genus. I can't remember, but I remember that then we, we just implemented this up to genus 112, and that's the data that we're going to be, use, uh, we're going to be using now. So we're going to be working on the specific local P2, that's just the canonical bundle over P2 on the toric side, and we'll be looking at the mirror of that. And we're going to be solving using the holomorphic anomaly equation. So I'm, I'm not going to need the form, but let me just say that this S, which appears here, is the so-called propagator variable, which is useful because it, it's all where all the anti-holomorphic dependence is. It also has some holomorphic dependence. It's not exactly Z bar, but if you don't really know the details, just think of S as Z bar and nothing else, and that's fine. And let's just try to solve this and generate data. So we generate 112 genomes. What can we do now? Well, the first thing that you can ask yourself is, well, these guys, they have holomorphic and anti-holomorphic uh, components, so what's going to happen with the large order? What's going to happen with the instanton action? Am I going to have to generalize the instanton actions from some holomorphic object into something which has both holomorphic and anti-holomorphic dependence, controlling the large order of those guys? Or, no, I'm going to have a nice holomorphic instanton action which actually can control the large order of both those guys up to further details we will discuss. Well, in order to answer these sort of, of, of questions, we need to come up with some way to compute n instanton contributions to the string-free energy. Uh, you see, the holomorphic anomaly equations, they're, they're, they're great at the perturbative level, but there's no way that I can put in here anything which makes um, some sort of non-perturbative claim. I mean, this is recursive on the perturbative itself. I would need something which is recursive on the non-perturbative themselves. So the way to do this, is actually to just rewrite the holomorphic anomaly for the partition function, and then just plug in a partition function which is an exponential of a trans series in the free energy instead of just an exponential of the perturbative. So this is nothing very fancy. So let's focus on the case where I have complex structure moduli space of dimension one. That's actually the case of local P2 that we're going to be doing. So there's a single Z, and S is basically Z bar. And it turns out that the equation for the holomorphic anomaly is something that looks like that for z 
Uh, it requires some initial data, just I get back the correct perturbative one, so it's not, so you know, the, the heat equation is something which is well known for a long time, but it needs a, a couple of corrections just to make sure that you get the right result. And if you plug in Z is exponential of F0, you precisely get, get back the holomorphic anomaly. That's good. Can we do something slightly different? Uh, what we can do, which is slightly different, is to plug in Z, which is a trans series, and then just crank the wheel. And if you do that, so the first thing you get, you get, you can get, as I said, um, a, a recursive sort of hierarchy of equations. That you know, it's all the lower guys. You, you get the upper guys. The first equation you get is that the instant action is holomorphic. So S is Z bar. So that's good because there was a previous claim in the literature that A should always be computed as combinations of periods in the geometry. So we're, we're in the right track. Let's see if we can do higher instanton guys. And it turns out that you can actually write down, again, for this uh, dimension one complex circuit model space, you can write down a generalization of the holomorphic anomaly for the genus G and instanton free energy. Okay, so they're sort of a quote unquote covariantization of the anti holomorphic derivative. There's a differential operator before was this square of the covariant derivative. There's a square term. Again, the structure itself is similar. The details are not relevant because I'm just going to show you the data now. So you can use this and try start computing at higher instanton levels genus G guys, and let's see what comes up. So I'm just going to tell you what the structure is, and I'm not going to show you any data. So it's well known that uh, the perturbative guys are just polynomials in this variable of specific degree in the standard topological string. And of course, the coefficients have holomorphic dependence. They need to be fixed. You, 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 use, you, know, you fix them at the conifold, use gap conditions, stuff like that. Doesn't really matter. So the structure of the non-perturbative, that's the one instanton and the two instanton, looks something like that. There's some exponential factors times polynomials. And this whole story, so I'm not going to be you more than this, this whole story can be taken uh, to the uh, uh, to the depth of Shatashvili limit. You can do the refined topological string, play all this game. I'm not going to be discussing that. So let's just consider the first two guys. And let's imagine that I computed a lot. Okay? So I have the perturbative with 112 and let's say the first three instantons about the genus 20, 30, something like that. What can you do? All right. Uh, here's a so local P2. Th this is just a data. So that's, I'm just going to tell you what goes on. So in local P2, there's basically there's a large order point. Uh, I'm sorry, a large radius point. <laughs> and there's a conifold point. These are the singularities in moduli space. And I'm expecting that the instanton actions are going to be suitable periods uh, next to these singularities. It turns out that the useful coordinate to use is psi and not z. So there are three conifold points in Psi. With instanton actions, you can compute in this via Picard, Picard Fuchs, whatever you want. So this is just the flat coordinate around the conifold, and it's given by this combination of um, hypergeometrics. So it's what it is. And it makes a prediction to what the instanton action should be. So that's that line in blue. So this is this function at conifold point one. And that's the prediction. That's what uh, the, 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 let's say, the subleading, so the leading growth of the perturbative is 2G the subleading is some instant on action, that's what it should be. Can we, can we uh, check that? So what I'm going to be doing now is basically this picture. I'm going to be, well, actually not even, I'm going to be doing even something more simple. I'm just going to be looking at the data, the FGs, and the leading growth should be factorial over A. And out of perturbative data, by just taking ratios of these guys that say G and G plus 1, I can isolate A, and by looking at G very large, I can have a prediction to what the instanton action should be. Does it match? So that's a prediction that comes from large perturbative large order data alone. Does it match our claim that it's the instanton action at the conifold or not? Well, of course it does, but let me show you exactly how that happens. So what I'm varying here is psi, so that's the coordinate on moduli space. I change this coordinate psi. And at each point, I'm telling you what the large order, the green dots are what the large order is saying. And you know, it's sort of convincing that they're spot on with what our theoretical, if you want prediction, what not numerical thing should be. Then there's a crossover to large radius. What's going on? So I have three instanton actions. 
and they will be valid in different parts, different regions of the Borel plane. I'll come back to that in a minute, but that's not the only singularity. There's also a ra large radius point, z equals zero, or psi inverse equals zero. And you can just use the mirror map and write down the Killing parameter in that region as a, a Myers G function. So in this region of moduli space, uh, there's another instant on action that comes into play. So basically I have three contacts and one large radius, and they all control this large order radius, uh, this large order growth. So there will be plots that you can do like this at different points in moduli space. And let me tell you, what do they look like? So what I'm plotting here is the Borel plane at different values of psi. So I start with, so I'm basically psi equals 2.5, 1.9, 1.51, 0, 0.8, 0.6. So I'm traveling around moduli space, and I'm trying to see where are all these instanton actions located and what, what's their nature. So in red, I'm plotting as psi varies the trajectory of the conifold one instant on action. Green is the trajectory as psi varies of the conifold two. And purple is the trajectory as psi varies of the large radius. So that's sort of, let's say, the analytical prediction. And now let, let's do a check. So what's a check that we're doing? Those are the dots that I'm going to explain next. Is the following. So I grab my, um, my perturbative data and I do the Borel transform. And then I approximate Borel-Padé. So now if I'm starting to plot mm, the poles of the Borel-Padé, those should accumulate next to the singularities with a tail that sort of, let's say, quote-unquote, mimics the log branch cuts. And you can see, uh, let's see, he, I, here, here is super explicit. So I have the conifold one, and I see accumulation of Borel-Padé poles, which are saying, well, uh, yeah, you have a singularity here, and you actually have a branch cut. So these guys are sort of saying where the log branch cut should be. And you can see that that's for the red and the green, that's generic at its snapshot on moduli space. They're going around and they're all there. But there is something which is a little bit more intricate, which is let's look at the large radius guy. That's the, the purple guy. And you can see it's there. So we have, of course, the amount of data is limited in order to properly probe a very nicely drawn uh, branch cuts, but we can definitely we see the singularity. It's still here. It's kind of there, but on here and there, which means that the Borel plane is not actually plane, but it's a complicated Riemann surface because this guy just went into another sheet. It's away from the principal sheet, which is closer to the origin and which is controlling the growth. And so this leads to uh, a more complicated structure, which is associated to co-equational resurgence, which I will not be discussing today. But this is just to give you a glimpse that all these instanton actions, they, they play, they have important roles in different regions of moduli space, and the structure is, is highly non-trivial. So at this stage, you could say, okay, cool, but that's just the perturbative guy. Somehow, you know, this could have been done in 2008 if you had grabbed the date of Clem and played with it up to the instanton action. But you're saying that uh, that's not just the whole story. There's a, a tower of instanton contributions that need to come into play. Can you test them? Are they really there? Can you go beyond the instanton action tests? Okay, let's do that. Let's look at the one instanton sector. Is the one instanton sector really there as we predict out of our non-perturbative generalization of the holomorphic anomaly? Um, so let me tell you what the test is that can be done. So let's look at the one instanton up there, and it's got this exponentially prefactor, and there's the polynomial, and you can write down what it is. I'm sort of hiding the details. And this is testable using a specific sequence. So I'm using here the perturbatives, which in some sense I've, uh, are valid because that's where the holomorphic anomaly starts. I'm using the instanton action around conifold one. That's where the test has been doing, which I already tested. So that's so good. And I'm using here one instanton. In principle, I already tested. So when I'm testing the one instanton at loop order h, I already tested the one instanton at h prime less than h. Okay. And I'm going to do this sequentially. You can do more, but let me just say h equals 0, 1, 2, 3. So checking them at three different points in moduli space. Okay? Let me flash tests and then just tell you what exactly they are. So these are going to be what the tests are going to look like. Now let's see what are we doing here. All right. So we're doing three different points in moduli space. So those are the three columns. So that's the different points we're testing in moduli space. And for those, we're testing the one instanton at 
loop orders 0, 1, 2, 3. So those are 0, 1, 2, 3. All right? And what do we use? So x, that's the, in the next plot, changes the value of the propagator around the holomorphic value. So I'm just changing s if you want. That's the variable. That's the x-axis. So I'm changing around holomorphic value. And then what am I testing? I'm testing in blue the real part and in green the imaginary part. These are generically complex functions of the one instant on guys. And again, the, the, the lines are what our equations tell us and the dots is what the numerics is telling us. And I think this is pretty convincing that everything is working fine. You could complain again and say, yeah, well, that's one instanton. Can you do two instantons? All right, let's check two instantons. At two instantons, things are more complicated because I have more possibilities. So I have a quote-unquote pure contribution. That's the two carnifold, uh, carnifold point instanton action, which looks like that. Again, we, you can compute the polynomials, everything. But there's a mixed contribution because remember there's an A and a minus A in string theory because of you know, this G string squared expansion. Uh, so th those two guys appear. How can we test them? We can test them because I already tested the one instanton and the larger the growth of the one instanton is dictated at leading order by two instantons. And they all come, this comes with a plus and that one comes with a minus but they're basically the same magnitude. So they need to be there. All right, let me flash you the tests. <laughs> what are they? So now I'm at a fixed point in moduli space, just to make things simpler, and I'm still varying in my x-axis. I'm still varying just uh, around the holomorphic value, just checking what's going on. And in the top figure, I am testing the real and the imaginary parts of the, let's say, quote-unquote, pure two instanton. That looks convincing. <laughs> and in the bottom picture, I'm testing the real and imaginary parts of the 1 comma 1. So I think it looks convincing. So and you can you know, play this game uh, for a long time and do lots of tests. And uh, at some stage, you are convinced that, yeah, fine. I mean, this trend series works. This should be describing the full non-perturbative topological string on local P2. What can you do with that? Let's do a check. One interesting thing that happens in local P2 is that there is actually, in the literature, for that example, there's a non-perturbative definition due to Marino and collaborators, which actually extends for uh, all toric labial geometries. Well, not all, at least genus one. Uh, let me just flash you what that idea is. I don't want to be discussing this too much. It's not my work. But then we see how the, the resurgent part exactly matches this. Okay, so the idea is basically the following. You grab the mirror curve, that's the mirror curve of local P2. That's the, the complex structure modulus. And the non-perturbative definition is based upon a quantization of this mirror curve. So basically, you get eigenvalues, if you want, <laughs> for, for, the, for the complex structure moduli. And some sort of quote-unquote uh, exponential Hamiltonian with standard commutation relations. And you, know, you quantize this object, and it turns out that this is actually, it behaves in a much nicer way than standard quantum mechanics. Actually, the inverse operator in L2R, in that Hilbert space, is stress class and positive definite. This is not true in a lot of <laughs> quantum mechanical, you know, undergraduate quantum mechanical problems. But here, great, it's, it's really nicely behaved, which means that the spectral, the Fredholm spectral determinant is analytic. And you can do a spectral trace expansion, and the canonical partition functions are going to be just defined like this. So that's, we're going to take this as given. That's what comes from the work in Mourinho and collaborators. This should be giving me a non-perturbative definition of the canonical partition function. Do they match against what comes out of, of the research and trend series or not? So here's uh, a, a test. So I have n and lambda, because basically these things are coming from two different uh, works, so they have different conventions. So here's just a quick map. Lambda is basically the flat coordinate at the, at the conifold, uh, which relates to n over h bar, and h bar is basically the inverse of g string. So, you know, everything is related. So let's not worry too much about that. And we can get exact values, that are the red dots, um, from the quantization prescription. And we can compute them at basically rational values of n and rational values of lambda up, up to pi, right? They're all rational. And we can see, do, do these things check or not? So 
In red is the exact results that come from the quantization prescription. And in black is just the perturbative for local P2. And you say, whoa, that's cool. That matches. So you're done. You don't need a trans series. Why, did, why are you telling us about the trans series? Well, that's because that's only good up to what your eyes can see. There's a systematic difference between each red dot and each point on the black line. And you know, if the trans series um, claim is correct, that systematic difference should be accounted at leading order by the one instanton, right? So you can check what's the difference between exact and perturbative and compare the value of that difference against the value of the leading contribution from the one instanton as computed from the trans series. Here's a check. So again, we're looking at the difference between exact and perturbative, compare it against one instanton. If you see a dot, they match. If you see a cross, they don't. And you say, well, that's only half good, <laughs> right? The colors just say how many digits of matching there are, so let's not worry too much about the colors. And you say, well, this is kind of interesting because I'm varying n and h bar, and there's some sort of region here where everything is fine and matching, and there's a region there that nothing is matching. So what's that dotted line? Because there's, there's a natural boundary between it works and it doesn't. That is the Stokes line. It's written up there. Stokes line for conifold 2, so which is sort of kicking in. And it's saying, if you cross the Stokes line, what happens? Well, I told you before that if you cross the Stokes line, you need to take into account Stokes phenomenon. So you know, you're certainly not expecting that if I cross the Stokes line, everything is fine on the other side. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a Stokes line, right? So what happens if I do that? Well, voila, everything works. So the Stokes jump actually is very simple in this case. And once I cross and I implement the Stokes jump, everything matches. So you can see how the trans series is exactly reproducing uh, the values of this uh, non-perturbative definition in the literature. So that looks great. But you can say, OK, that's fine. Because maybe there are some examples where I don't have a non-perturbative definition, and then I can just use the trans series and compute stuff. But there's other cases where I have a non-perturbative definition. Do I really need a trans series or not? So let me just flash you one transparent. Uh, this is ongoing work, so I, I, I don't have a lot to say about this. <laughs> but I can at least motivate why the trans series is still always very relevant. And let's look at another case. That's the case of local P1 cross P1. And for this case, there are actually two distinct non-perturbative definitions in the literature. <laughs> so you know, some cases we com complain we don't have non-perturbative definitions. Here we have two. So we should be very happy. Well, yes and no, because then we have to decide which one is right. Or you know, are they both right in some sense? And let me just tell you what the two things are. So one is basically the same as before, quantization of the mirror curve. The mirror curve now looks like that. You can you know, uh, do the game and get the, the Fredholm determinant, spectral trace expansion, partition function comes out. There's a actually much older definition in the literature. It goes back to work of Waffen Marino and collaborators, which tells us that there's sort of holographic dual to a churn simons partition function on a lens space. It's basically a quotient of the sphere by Z2, which localizes to a two matrix model. So you could ask, which one is right? And I would say, well, they're both right. <laughs> So then you could ask, in what or how much do these definitions differ? From, you know, from a certain point of view, this is just a question on, you know, I'm defining, I'm giving non-perturbative definitions for string theory, and I should be worried if I'm giving two different ones. So this has nothing to do with trans series and research. But then trans series may come and say, well, hang on. Uh, these definitions, if they differ, they should, be a, should only differ by exponentially suppressed stuff. So I have lots of instantons. And in this case of local P1 cross P1, I have also a large radius singularity. I have conifold singularity. I have orbifold singularity. So I really have lots of instanton actions and instanton sectors at play. And at most, these definitions can differ by which sectors am I turning on or off. Then you can ask, well, if that's true, can the same trans series match both results? We believe yes, but we don't have results in the sense that by turning on some instant on sectors and off some others, I am going into one definition or I'm going into another definition. This is just like thinking of what I said before, that the trans series parameter is like a boundary condition of a differential equation. 
So the train series is giving you a family of solutions. And by fixing the train series parameter, the boundary condition, according to some sort of allowed theme that we don't really know yet, you're picking different solutions to this uh, differential equation. And this would be two solutions. Maybe there is only two and there is no up to some adequate criteria. But that's work in progress. So the answer is likely yes. And then you can say, but what else is the trend series giving me? The trend series is actually giving me something else, regardless of all this. It's giving me a semi-classical decoding. It's telling me that, you know, whatever non-perturbative definition I have, sometimes it's sort of a black box. It's also telling me what's the semi-classic physics of each non-perturbative definition. What are the sort of d brains which are relevant and which are not relevant? Are those the ones next to the orbifold, the conifold, to the large radius, and so on? So they're quite useful. So I, I think I have 15 minutes, so let me just tell you a little bit about what goes on from the matrix model point of view. So this, we sort of looked at what happens from the closed string point of view, but we can sort of use uh, duality and ask what happens from the open string point of view, the, all these things. So I'm basically, okay, let me show you the slide. I'm basically going to be looking at the uh, Dijkraaf alpha like geometries now and make a few comments on standard matrix models. You can ask the same questions we asked before. Now for the large n limit instead of the string expansion, but basically, you know, everybody knows very well that it's basically the same. And so we're going to be looking at the, the gauge theory side. If you want, that's the matrix model. We're going to be looking at the remission one matrix model with some potential V. There's a G string there. I'm integrating over n by n matrices, and I'm just normalizing by the volume of the gauge group. Can you play the same game here? Well, you already guessed that the answer should be yes, so let's see how that's going to go. So I'm going to show you some results for the quartic matrix model. So basically, I'm taking a potential which is quartic. So eigenvalues accumulate around the critical points of the potential. And generically, I could have eigenvalues accumulated around the three critical points. And we call that a, a three-cut solution. Uh, there's two particular solutions that we've solved resurgently with resurgent trend series. That's the one cut. Here, I'm plotting the holomorphic effective potential. Here's the one cut geometry. That's the spectral curve of the matrix model. And the two cuts Z2, here's the two cuts in the holomorphic uh, effective potential plot. And the instantons just come from B cycles in these geometries. These are well known for a long time, and we've checked that uh, also here. So, what are the solutions? Let's look at again at the data. The way, okay, just a word on this. So, the way this is solved is by looking at the string equation. So, if by any chance you don't know what the string equation is, just one minute comment, which is that I can use these weights as a kernel to construct orthogonal polynomials. And I can construct orthogonal polynomials in the quartic matrix model. And they're basically generated recursively. And there's a recursion coefficient r, which tells me how to get the next from the previous one, sort of. If I know all those guys, then I also know the partition function. All right, so here's the continuous version of what this recursion coefficient satisfy. They satisfy a finite difference equation, basically because you know, in the discrete case, they're just indexed by uh, an integer. It's a nonlinear difference equation, and you can ask, can you use uh, resurgence and trans series to solve it? And the answer is yes, and just going to flash you the solution and then look at what are the consequences rather than showing you uh, all these functions that we computed a lot of them, but they're not <laughs> very elucidative. So that's what the trans series looks like. It's a, we have plus a and minus a, so we already know there's a string theory hidden in there. It appears here in the exponential. And around, so we have instanton sectors which are n slash m, and we computed a lot of these guys. Uh, I think we computed of the order of 200 of them. Uh, genus 200, that's what I'm saying. Then in, in the instanton numbers, maybe five, six. Some, some of them are a little bit harder. So this is fully non perturbative solution, and we should be able to describe everything. Okay? So we've done many resurgent checks. Let me just tell you a resurgent check that you can make of this. Again, there are no theorems, the story of before. Let's check asymptotics just to see if things are on the right way. And let me do this in the double scaling limit. So there's a sort of a critical point of this matrix model where th that equation there, the string equation, becomes that differential equation over there. So basically the R's, the capital R's, become U. And the Z here is G string, if you want. And this is, of course, 100 years in the making, Pundlevy 1 equation, very famous, and tells you the U minus f double prime tells you how to get, eventually, the partition function out of the solution to Pont-Livet. 
So this is all very well known that it has a perturbative solution that describes a string theory, in fact, 2D quantum gravity. And you, you know, plug this back into differential equation, you have a recursion equation, and up comes this out. If you start looking at all these numbers, these are rational numbers, and you sequence them, they grow 2G factorially fast. What's the resurgent trans theory solution to this? Well, now we actually have an interesting way to see why there's the two instanton actions. It comes from the fact that that equation is second order. And then when you write down the resurgent trans series for that, it looks like this. So this is very similar to what we had before with all those sectors there. There are some log sectors, but they're not actually a series because they have a finite sum. Okay, so here's a test. This is what just what I want to tell you. A test of why this resurgent trans series should be working well. And so let me go back to this picture of asymptotics so that I can tell you what that test is. Again, I'm doing this test. And I'm basically looking at this sequence at large order. This is a bunch of rational numbers. And I'm seeing if I start including instanton contributions, am I matching those rational numbers or not? That's not completely straightforward because there's factors of pi and square root or square root of three going around. <laughs> so I'm wondering, is this going to match? And so what we do here, uh, we go up to genus 30, trying to match the prediction from large order uh, against the, the non-perturbative contributions I cont com compute from there. And then I include one instanton, two, three, four, five, six instantons, and I check how many digits are matching, and 60 digits are matching. So I think this should be convincing also that <laughs> all this is good. Uh, as I said, uh, we need Stokes data, and in this example, uh, there's one Stokes coefficient that we know that's up there, computed by Francois David in 91 or 92, I think. But there's a whole lot more Stokes coefficients needed, and here's a bunch that we computed numerically. We don't know what these numbers are. Okay, you, you know, there's the usual thing that you know what that number is, but the other ones we don't, and you can put it in the computer, nothing comes out. These are probably sums of transcendental numbers. That's the guess that we are right now, and we're trying to guess what are these transcendental numbers that sum up to these numbers that are unguessable in some way. Uh, but anyways, we've there, it's not like you have to compute an infinite amount of numbers. These, these guys are all related to each other. There's lots of relations between these. So a handful so far, we have three. Perhaps there's four or five numbers that you need to know in order to know everybody else. So you have this, this data that comes in numerically. Everything else comes in analytically, and you can just play with it. All right, so yeah, I have five minutes. I can flash you a couple of more plots. Um, what can we do? Now we have this um, trend series. Um, can we play with it? Let's play with it a bit. So this is the phase diagram of the full quartic matrix model. So what I'm planting here is the complex Toft plane. And, uh, so that's the and I'm plotting anti-Stokes line. So this should be phase boundary. So what does that mean? And remember, at the Stokes line, there's an exponentially suppressed guy that, oh, that guy comes along. I go around the complex plane, it grows. When it hits the same value as the perturbative, that's an anti-Stokes line because that's a phase boundary. Next, the instantons are going to dominate. And we have different regions with different asymptotics for the partition. Some of them were already known, others we're uncovering now. So what, what are these regions? So here this is the blue blobs. This is, of course, one and two. You should guess that this is the region where the one-cut solution is uh, the, the canonically dominant solution in the grand canonical partition function. And the two is where the, the two-cut solution is dominant. So let me just tell you what we can say about that. We call these phases Stokes phases. So again, I, we have the one or the z2-symmetric two-cut solutions. And the asymptotics we find are, the, well, that should be 1 over n squared. It's the usual 1 over n squared perturbative expansion alongside instanton corrections. So, and these guys have if a dicraft buffer dual geometry, which is well known. But you see, that's a tiny portion of the, the full phase diagram. So I have these dots here. That's the double scaling limit to polynomial for 1, and here's the double scaling limit to polynomial for 2. So basically, that's 2D gravity or 2D supergravity. OK, that's fine, also no. So then we have the green regions. What happens in the green regions? We call them anti Stokes phases. They've been already discussed previously in the literature a little bit. What we know is that we have three cuts. And they're all basically, if you want, at the same level. So they're all at the same energy level. 
eigenvalues can jump in between them without any energy cost. And so this leads to the, you want, quote unquote, destruction of the 1 over n squared expansion. And all I'm going to have is we're going to find for the partition function oscillatory asymptotics in n. So these are theta-like functions. These guys, from a string dual point of view, would be like a bunch of geometries that are all fluctuating because they're all basically at the same energy. And we're, you know, space time is jumping in between all of them at the same time. But that's not the worst. <laughs> the worst is that there's this green, no, not green, what's that called? A pink region uh, outside, which goes all the way, by the way, all the way to t equals infinity, infinitely strong couple. And we call this a trivalent phase. We call this a trivalent phase because this is how eigenvalues agglomerate in trivalent trees. This is eigenvalue accumulation at t equals 5, 75 eigenvalues. So this we only know so far numerically. They have more intricate theta-like asymptotics. And we know some numerics about them. And say, OK, that's good. But I would like, so five minutes, OK, let me tell you just at least in point. I'd like to, to see if I can say something analytically, because you know, um, you have this trans series. Can you play with it and make some analytic claim about all these different phases? And here's one method that we're, we're exploring on how to do this. And let's do this in Pont Levy, just to be, uh, you know, for five minutes. Pont Levy solutions, generically, they have double poles. This is basically how Pont Levy found these equations. And they, they are such that they translate to simple zeros of the partition function. So these are, are the Liang zeros of the partition function. So if you're looking at, you know, uh, different phases of the theory, those, those zeros should be sort of important. Uh, we have a trans series here. I'm just plotting for you the one parameter trans series just for the sake of simplicity. What can you do with it? This is sum over all instant ons, and then there's a sum over loops. And one, you know, almost stupid question you could say is, can I change the order of those summations? Why don't I just first over instant ons uh, and then worry about string corrections? What would happen if I would do that? Well, let's, let's try to do that, see what happens. You know, the first thing that I have to worry about is this beta. So I'm looking at g equals 0. I'm trying to sum over all n's. That would be the leading order. But there's still a component here, z to the power beta n. So how do these betas, these characteristic exponents, behave? It turns out that they behave like that. So for different n's, that's the, the series in g I would want to be summing. So they grow linearly in n. So I can ask, instead of you know, going straight up, why don't I just sum as in the red arrow, I sum over all the first leading guys, and then I compute string corrections by computing the next orders. Is that going to work? Is that not going to work? How's that going to be? So we've dubbed this analytic trans series summation. So let's try to do this. You introduce this variable tau, which basically includes a trans monomial and some square root of z, just to make things simpler. And if you do the resummation, it looks something like that. So you have, that's the leading guy. And then you have r orders in g. Those would be the, the next few arrows that you have there. And those are what these U, capital U, functions look like. Now, surprisingly, these are convergent series now. <laughs> so you can actually compute these functions. And this, some of this was known already in the mathematics literature. It goes by the name of transasymptotics. So let's do that sum for U0 in Pont Levy. So it turns out that in an adequate variable, that U0 of Pont Levy also satisfies the Weierstrass elliptic function equation, which is sort of expected to see in Pont Levy. But generate in the sense that the exact result at leading order is and you say, well, you said that there were double poles, so I found a double pole. Actually, no, actually I found uh, an infinite number of double poles. Remember that the double pole is at tau equals 1, but tau was given by this quantity, right? So in the z plane, I still have to do the inversion of the Lambert W function. So I have an array of poles. Where are those poles sitting? So here's a an numerical plot of Pont Levy, just to wrap up. So solutions of Pont Levy 1 have been classified by Boutros well, four years, I think, after Pont Levy paper. And they're classified as following. So there's a three truncate solution. So basically, there's a Z5 symmetry of Pont Levy. So the, the complex Z plane, uh, you can put it in five pizza slices. The three truncate solutions, they only have poles in one of the slices. Then there are truncate solutions which have poles in three pizza slices. And there are general solutions that evolve everywhere. All the slices are filled. 
Turns out that the perturbative series alone is enough to define that guy. The truncate requires the one parameter. That's what I'm looking at now. So that's what I will be talking. General solutions require two parameters. So what we find when we do this tau equals 1 and invert back to W is the first line, the first array of poles, this guy here in the three truncate. And then if you do the further sum, you get this, 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 and they come one after the other. And you can say, OK, that's good. But do you have to do this in an infinite number of times? It's kind of boring. It takes a long time. So we can look, instead of the, the solution, we can look at the partition function instead. This is the starting orders for the partition function. And it looks like that. So what we've been doing so far is the red arrows. But you could say, hang on. But the perturbative, it's growing. The, the starting orders is going quadratically fast. Can you do that? Can you do analytic quadratic analytic transserial summation? And the answer is yes. And the answer is going to be if you do that and you plot of the partition function, is it get the whole field of poles at once? Of course, they're not in the exact positions. I have to put in corrections, but these are g-string corrections. So you get the general picture, and then you just slightly adapt them, and you get the answers. Okay, so I have 20 seconds, so I'm going to stop there. So let me just say that you can do the same game for the full matrix model, and even for the partition function, you can get partition functions for the matrix model at complex values of the rank. So that's also cool. All right, so in the last three seconds, let me just tell you that I hope I've convinced you that resurgence entrance series are powerful tools in string theory, that you can define lots of subservables non perturbatively which is starting off from perturbation theory and playing this game. And you, you, you get some extra bonus because you can go to continuous values of the parameters, negative, complex, whatever. I mean, you're not constrained by any requirements of integrali integrality anymore. And furthermore, they provide semi-classical decodings of many of non-perturbative results. You can have a black box, and that can tell you what semi-classical is important or not. OK, so we still, there's still a lot of work to be done, of course. I mean, we still need to look at all these non-perturbative phases, describe them completely analytically. So we have a few things already describing analytic phases, not all of them. Uh, we would like to do more matrix models and more Calabi-out geometries. But hopefully, this will come up to be a systematic tool to access finite and complex coupling. Thank you very much. Any question? Well, we can talk at 